Okay, can everyone hear me? Excuse me for my hoarseness, but it's, it's not my fault. <clears throat> the information age whets our appetite for the exploration of the unknown. As inquisitive social beings and innate explorers of the universe, we are standing at a threshold of curiosity and movement. More than idea sharing over vast distances, we are poised to physically actualize these explorations. Biological and technological advancements reveal themselves in our everyday lives. Echoing prophecies and environmental visions for American, from American pulp science fiction. Architecture today rolls, flows, inflates, breathes, expands, multiplies, and contracts, finally hoisting itself up as Archigram predicted in the early 1960s to go in search of its next user. While architecture's purpose remains constant, providing shelter from the natural elements and community among its inhabitants, mobile and portable structures herald the dawn of the age of new nomadism. The applications and uses are limitless. These buildings have no borders. Diversity of material palette, design style, and transportation method are varied. Mobile architecture, then, can be defined not merely in terms of mo movable structures, but rather as a way of intellectually inhabiting a specific environment at a specific time and place in a way that better reacts to an increasingly frequent social shift. <clears throat> It is my pleasure uh, to be here tonight to introduce Juk van Lieshout to the quintessentially mobile city Los Angeles and in the most modal of architectural schools, SciArc. I spent last weekend, it was my privilege to spend last weekend at the Wexner Center where Juk and I participated in a symposium which brought together a wide variety of artists, architects, and technophiles all speaking about media and culture after which we proceeded to, uh, as is typical in most symposium, eat a lot and drink a lot, which naturally inflamed my tongue and put Joop and I on a collision course whose main thrust was mobile communities. I hope that he can forgive me as the red wine got the best of me at the moment. Joop van Luchout studied sculpture at the Rotterdam <coughs> Academy of Art and founded Atelier van Luchout in 1995. AVL is a multidisciplinary collective whose work blurs the line between art, architecture, and design. As AVL, at AVL, design and realization are in-house products. Originally known for his multiples, crude fiberglass furniture and sanitary facilities that resemble mass-produced items, AVL produces an assortment of work ranging from commercial products like bathtubs and bars to some of the work that you will see tonight, the good, the bad, and the ugly a massive mobile art lab for the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. The recent project, AVLville, is a self-sustaining alternative lifestyle paramilitary compound, complete with organic farms, communal living quarters, and facilities for making weapons, bombs, and booze, all run by power, generation, power generations that use pig dung for fuel. Other work consists of architectural commissions for private clients and cultural institutions, ranging from garden sheds to gallery facilities, from offices to cafeterias. Please help me to welcome Juk van Leeshout. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes, good. So, uh, my name is Joep van Nieshout, and uh, as uh, Jennifer told, I was uh, educated as a sculptor in Rotterdam. I left art school in 1985, and actually, all the time that I have been um, active, uh, always made uh, functional objects. And when I, whether they were called art or design or architecture, actually never interested me too much. Although there were a lot of people who thought my work was about this crossing the borders. And uh, in fact, crossing the borders uh, is not interesting to me. And um, in that sense, I'm, uh, although my work is very use uh, functional and usable, um, in, a, in a way I'm a real artist, you could say. And uh, uh, a 
uh, description, my preferred description uh, of an artist is uh, someone who cannot stop doing what he is doing. And, uh, and it's a person who follows his intuition and his feelings. And uh, in that sense, he is well, a little bit loose from society. Anyway, uh, these are one of the early uh, sculptures, 1983. And uh, they're both are tools. And the left thing is a, a blacksmith's fire to uh, forge uh, swords. And that's uh, a grinding stone. And to me, the production process has always been very important. And for example, for the, the grinding stone, let me see. The grinding stone itself, I thought it was necessary. I, of course, you can buy a grinding stone somewhere in a shop, but I thought it was necessary to go to Germany, to go to a quarry, to take chisels and to take out the, uh, the stone myself, bring it back, and then make the whole sculpture. So the whole process actually was very important for me, uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, the existence of the sculpture. Uh, there's another work, it's a, a boat, and inside this boat there was a steam engine. And Actually all those sculptures from the beginning were very associative uh, works, and actually were like kind of um, film sets, or film props, so actually every object told a story. I don't think the... Can you go back this one please? I think that two slides disappeared. Anyway, I hope uh, it will be solved later. Uh, this is a, a, a chaise long, a sofa that uh, I built and consists out of uh, bones of a horse, uh, forged steel, leather, and here there is a, a little table with a gun inside that fires backwards, and there is uh, the manuscripts of Machiavelli and some glasses that I uh, modeled myself. Uh, there's another uh, sculpture, it's, called, it's a portative, like a portable organ. And like the previous work, uh, were pretty uh, uh, cool. And this was a, a work that I made to, to contemplate. So you can use, uh, you can play nice music. And then there was also an operation table, but I think it disappeared in the slides. And um, I've been doing this, uh, this kind of sculpture works for like uh, three years or so, five, four years, five years. And then I was really uh, getting uh, bored by my own work because to me it was uh, too easy, too simple. Or for me it was very, I was very handy with my hands so I could uh, make a lot of beautiful stuff. And I was looking for like uh, a more conceptual approach and that uh, was not so difficult to find. Of course in my studio I had this beer crates and uh, concrete slabs, which are in Holland are very uh, uh, standardized materials. So every sidewalk in the Netherlands has this uh, 30 by 30 centimeter slabs, and the beer crates are all the same. And then in fact, because uh, the standardization and uh, modular uh, size system, those materials fitted together. And the fact that it fitted together like one solid block was for me uh, good enough reason to say this sculpture is finished. So I, actually I wanted to, to get rid of all the uh, artistic inputs that you normally have as an artist. So you have the material, uh, the shape, the uh, authenticity, and this was just, well, very conceptual. And then with the beer crates uh, I also made a uh, computer program and then you could type in the sizes of the, the exhibition space and then you get a file like this of all possible uh, shapes uh, of cubes uh, that could fit in that space. And then I just choose a certain, a, a certain um, size. Like this one, for example, is uh, 160 by 160 by 160 centimeters. So you could make with this beer crate, you could make like a, a lot of uh, different Uh, varieties. And then uh, this is about 1989. Uh, um, I thought 
I mean, I was, you have to understand, I was at that time was really completely operating in the art world. I said uh, to myself, like, well, it's still art, this beer crates. I want to make like something that's not art. And uh, so I said, okay, let's make furniture. And then the furniture, I want to have like the absolute minimum design. So uh, I make a recipe in which I describe all the sizes and uh, uh, of the table. So it's very, very mathematical and very simple to make a whole series of tables. And there's no detail, there's only seven colors, and all the sizes are um, a part of this simple size system. And um, um, Well, actually, this exhibition that I had in 1989 was very um, revolutionary, you could say, because at that time, uh, uh, it was not so common that artists make furniture or make functional objects or that architects uh, make artworks. So this crossover thing that didn't really exist. There were some pioneers, but not uh, nobody was as um, as uh, uh, ruthless, you could say, as I, because I, I said I don't care. I had a, a big sense of uh, indifference. I still have. And uh, after some time, uh, I wanted to make artworks that, in a way, were more minimal than the tables I just showed you. I said, okay, I just want to be a contractor. I just want to make those works that clients ask me to, uh, um, that clients ask me to build. Like, for, some, for example, if someone wants to have uh, a bathtub, I make a bathtub. If they want to have a desk, I make a desk. desk. And then the idea was that the client would make the design himself, and then I would just build it as a, as a contractor, you could say. And uh, that didn't work because they, uh, they uh, wanted uh, me to design it, which was a pity. So, uh, um, so I make a lot of different uh, varieties, uh, bathes, um, uh, bars and uh, a lot of furniture. And always, uh, the production process, uh, the production itself has always been very important to me. And uh, up till this moment, uh, we execute, we construct all the works that we design in our studio. And very often those kind of things have very much to do with uh, what's the simplest way to build uh, a sink or a bathtub. If I just take some uh, pieces of plywood, you cut them up, screw them together, and cover it with fiberglass. And uh, so the, the, the production process is, uh, all, you could say like the, the objects are designed by a carpenter instead of a designer. And uh, could I have some water, please? And um, so they make many different things. This is an exhibition uh, in Brussels where we produced many, many, uh, toilets and sinks, like a mass production of, um, of art. And um, so actually one of the few things that art is, is that uh, it is authentic and uh, unique. And uh, I always, no, well not since 19, uh, since this period, I made um, works in uh, unlimited editions. And then uh, I started to make uh, the uh, to make bigger things. First was like a bathtub, and then I started to make sanitary units. And this unit is uh, in uh, in Italy, in front of a castle, and it's hooked up to the to the castle uh, with a, a tube and um, electricity. And then all the systems inside, like heating and pumps and all the uh, electricity and insulations, are in this unit. So you could actually put this unit on wheels, so you can put it anywhere and just uh, plug it on. <coughs> and, um, and I also don't like to buy stuff in the shop. So, uh, for example, uh, instead of buying a, a rail to put your, hand, uh, your towel, I just say, okay, why don't you why don't we put a piece of wood there and then we cover it with fiberglass and it's cheaper and it looks nicer. And the whole thing becomes like one object instead of uh, 
assembly of uh, lots of uh, small things. This is another one. And uh, I'm always very much interested in the small spaces, uh, more small spaces than in big spaces, um, um, probably because I'm Dutch. And also because I see object, uh, I see uh, architecture or objects. Sorry, I see architecture as objects. So like something you can uh, take, take away, put it on the truck, and put it somewhere else instead of something that it's uh, uh, fixed on the um, fixed on the land. So that's why you have to make small stuff. And uh, of course, I think when you make a small space, you are more challenged to. Uh, be creative and to find solution, to find solutions to create uh, extra space, but also to make an attractive space. Uh, these are some uh, units information stands that I made for uh, uh, some uh, Swiss clients, and this is a. Um, uh, uh, this is a, a slave unit, and uh, so actually, what I told you—the the, 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 the units that you can use, like the bathroom—you can also uh, attach them to a building, and I call those units a slave unit. And a slave unit is a kind of an architectural unit with a specific function, and uh, and the whole space, the whole slave unit, actually is built around its function and its use. And here you can also see the. The, that the outside is actually the, the, the result of the, 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 necess uh, the necessary space inside. And uh, so we just take out the window of this building and we attach it with some uh, huge bolts to this building. And what I really like about this sculpture is the skylight. Because we made the sculpture, and then uh, after some time uh, we said, okay, we need some skylight, it's nice to have some lights inside. And then, uh, well, I tried to, what we normally do in the workshop, you know, we stand in, the, in this thing, and then we make round skylights, but ah, it doesn't look nice. And then uh, we make a rectangular, uh, triangular, it doesn't look, they all look like a kind of silly and not good. And then one week before I crashed my car, and the only thing that I have left over, were the, the carpets that were in the car. And I saw them and I said, wow, that's the perfect shape. So we, uh, we, uh, we, we cut out those shapes of the, of the ceiling and put uh, fiberglass, transparent fiberglass, and we had the ideal uh, uh, skylights. So still this coincidence of, of like for example, the beer crates and still and still at the moment is a um, kind of um, important factor in the work. There's another piece uh, that we built for a museum in Utrecht. And they needed, uh, for the refurbishment, they needed a temporary cafeteria, uh, which I did. And actually, it has the shape of a, of a, a dick, a penis, which is penetrating the museum. And then one, one testicle is the, the kitchen, and the other one is the um, well, the waiting room, you could say, right? where you use the, your things. And um, so those sexual objects, dicks, basically, uh, have always been very uh, important in my work. I will show you many more later. <laughs> and uh, this is another object. And this is a, a, what I call the master and slave unit. I just explained to you the slave unit. And the master unit is actually this box in the middle, uh, which, which has um, about eight or so uh, holes in it of the same size. And on this, in this hole, you can attach those uh, units, those slave units. And this is a, a bedroom, it's a kitchen, and this is the bathroom, and here is the office. So actually, you could. Uh, <coughs> Uh, yeah, this is the other side. And <coughs> actually, you could um, uh, so take off all those slave units and put them on another location, or you can take them off and replace them by another type, a bigger one, 
uh, you could put two slave units next to each other. And so it's like a very flexible system uh, to, um, to uh, 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 as a house in a way. What I told you about the architecture as an object, well, this is like that. It's a mobile home. And uh, nothing is fixed. So you, the whole layout is uh, flexible. And even the location where you put it is flexible. Like normal, an architect has to do with light and north and uh, entrance and location. And here it's completely uh, indifferent of that. Another reason for me to build things on, on wheels is. Uh, um, I call it uh, building regulations, because in Netherlands there is a very uh, strong uh, building regulations, and but it's not for uh, objects, relocatable, temporary, or movable objects. So they have another kind of uh, code, and uh, those rules were in you know, were made in the Netherlands in the 20s or so to protect poor people for greedy uh, developers. And so, so they said, well, if you have a house, you need to have a toilet, minimum size this, and you want to have a bathroom, and have this, and the minimum height of the ceiling is that. So for example, if you want to have your bathroom in, or your toilet in your living room, they say, no, it's not possible. And those rules were made for the protection of the people, but time changes, but the rule stays the same. And um, and actually, I, 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 in a way, I concentrate on finding uh, loopholes, like holes, to in in the in this uh, um, in those rules to uh, find uh, possibilities to do stuff. Well, that's why the wheel is this. This is the interior. The whole structure is pretty small, but the main structure is uh, uh, ten foot by uh, 20, 20, 23 foot or something like that. But it looks bigger because uh, uh, we, we actually saw the interior as a sculpture. So you, you play with the heights of the, of the ceiling and the, the level of the floor. And like that you can uh, create a space or well-being. There's another uh, sculpture called La Bezodrome, which is a French word for uh, fuck truck. And actually, it's like the whole thing is made for uh, love. So there's a sit pit, there's a mini bar, there's a upholstered table, and in the slide out part, there is a bed to rest. Oh. And uh, I, al I also like to find uh, very simple solutions, like for example here, this is the toilet, which actually is just a hole in the, in the floor, and that uh, solves the problem uh, pretty uh, simple. It works very good. <laughs> Never had any complaints till now. This is another one. It's a mobile home. It's a combination of a mobile home and a truck, actually, so you can change the mobile home in the truck, and vice versa. And this back door uh, can be exchanged with normal truck doors, and then uh, it's a truck. And here, inside here, there is the bathtub and the toilet. This is uh, two sculptures in use. <laughs> See it again? <laughs> And this is um, another object uh, we made. It's a, tem uh, I call it a transportable exhibition space, and has like this is well, a pretty large mobile home uh, in which they can make the exhibitions. And this orange thing uh, functions as the office, but also as the entrance. And then, of course, you can attach this thing on this side or on this side. So there's always many different possibilities to put it together. And uh, as I told you, the production is very important always, and also the material. And we try to find material that they use in well, different places. And then we, um, uh, well, yeah. <coughs> we try to use other material to make uh, beautiful things. And this, for example, is uh, uh, insulation material, 
that they use for uh, insulation of big tanks in the chemical industry. And it's built out of polyurethane foam and they, they, it's pretty cheap and they can make it in all different shapes that you want. And then you just glue it together. It's very light, there's almost nothing. It's very uh, fragile as well. So you have to build it together. You make a temporary frame inside and uh, then you, you make the thing out of this uh, foam. And then very, you have to take a lot of care, you cover the outside with fiberglass. And once that gets hard, you can take away the frame on the inside. And then you can put fiberglass on the inside. And then you get a sandwich construction that's very strong and durable and uh, uh, has a very good insulation uh, value. And uh, so this is a technique that we developed ourselves. Uh, well, fiberglass, well, everything I make is, uh, almost everything is made out of fiberglass. And um, it's my favorite material because you can be, uh, you can build stuff together from all kinds of different material with kind of a low craftsmanship and then you cover it with the fiberglass, which is a kind of cloth uh, that you put on top of it and then you impregnate it with resin and then after an hour or so it's hard. And uh, so many problems as leakage, uh, you know, you, I don't have because it's just the fiberglass fix all the problems. And if there's a problem, we use silicone to solve that problem. This is the interior of the of this thing. And this is a, a modular building system that we designed, uh, but we never actually uh, used it except for exhibitions. And it's a system that consists out of um, wall panels of two different sizes and uh, inverted slave units, as I call them. And they are like uh, wall panels with a function included. Like for example, uh, here there is a dinette, this is a kitchen, on the other side there is a butcher shop. And so you can bolt those units together and then you just have to add a roof, which is also uh, part of this model system. And then you can, um, yeah, you have unlimited possibilities to build uh, houses or utility spaces. This piece is called uh, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. And actually this title, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, is very, um, uh, let's say, it's very uh, uh, applicable to many of our works. There's always something good and always something bad and always something ugly. And uh, this was a commission for the Walker Art Center in, in Minneapolis to build a mobile art lab. And that's, um, a mobile home, you could say, that they can use to bring the good word of the art to the poor people and to schools and things like that. So they make exhibition in the unit and then they drive around. And um, um, so they asked me to, to build this thing, which of course was, uh, I was very flattered. It was a very good museum and very nice people. But on the same hand, time I had the idea it was uh, too decent. Um, uh, well, I, I felt I could have asked any designer. I mean, you know, why should he ask me? Uh, uh, I was um, it was too nice. So then I I said, okay, it's good. I will make this thing. But I also want to add something. You know, add like the feeling of uh, of the underworld, you could say, like something bad, something dark. Well, that's the back black house, and actually, it's um, uh, yeah, I'll show this. So this is the interior. So there is a little uh, space for the people who does the who works there, and then uh, inside it's empty, but you can put tables there, or you can hang paintings or uh, whatever, and there is a. The whole site you can open, so if you have like a little concert or a theater, they can do it over there. And the house, 
on first sight looks like a, a cabin, like a cabin used for fishing or hunting. It's very straightforward, very simple. And, uh, but there are also two spaces, uh, add-ons you could say, oh, no, one add-on on the left hand side with a kind of a secret door, you have to find the door a little bit. And when you go in, you find a kind of laboratory. And you don't know what happens in this laboratory, you only see this kind of machine. And actually it's a machine to make uh, environmentally unfriendly paint. And uh, on the attic, which is also uh, the hatch, uh, is a place like a cage. And uh, you can imagine all kind of uh, terrible things happening uh, in this attic. I mean, a basement would have been better, but it was impossible to make a basement uh, on this place. So we had to do it on the attic. But nevertheless, the message uh, got through. And um, so another part which is very uh, important of the work is morality. And, uh, and that's why, for example, I use this book of Machiavelli in one of the first slides I showed you on, on, the, on this uh, uh, sofa. Because Machiavelli, he was a scientist from, uh, from uh, Italy around 1500, and he is actually the first person who wrote a book about politics and sociology. And uh, it was a book written for people who wanted to have power, and uh, how to extend your power, how to keep your power, and so, and so on. And this book is a very objective description about the subject. And uh, well also Machiavelli was considered as someone who was amoral. Not immoral, but like, you know, he was not a bad person. But he didn't say, well, I don't care about morality. If you want to keep your, for example, if you have, uh, you conquer a piece of land from your, your neighbor, your, your, the, the count or whatever. Uh, well, you have to kill the guy, of course and his wife, and his children, and his brothers, and so on. Because if you don't do that, they will come back to you. So he was very, uh, very cool in that sense. But on the other hand, uh, he was, uh, 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 he, he didn't, um, uh, he didn't care about it, in a way you could say. He was, he was a scientist, and all scientists are amoral, or should be amoral, maybe. Anyway. Oops. Then um, this uh, sculpture, so through the years I always make uh, abstract sculptures, you could say, or figurative sculptures. Like this one, it's called the Biopic. It's 1994 uh, or something, 92. The father and his two sons. Uh, on the left, it's, uh, it's called the Dick Tree, and was a, a commission for a mental hospital, which you can see in the back. <laughs> it's very popular, I have to say. And uh, the other one, it's a, a, a mobile, you could say, you can hang it, and it's called the Pity Pool one. Here are some other sculptures, they're called AVL Men. What about AVL man? AVL man is a kind of a modeler man, like the modeler man of uh, Le Corbusier. He made this kind of standardized uh, figure and on which he uh, designed all his buildings. So I also make this uh, modular man, AVL man, which is much more uh, rational and uh, 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 much more standardized. So everything, like the legs, the arms, the head, everything is built out of uh, cylinders of a certain size. And the one on the right, uh, standing at, uh, um, I thought, still, to make alcohol. And uh, actually we made uh, three or four stills, and this is the most uh, uh, sophisticated one. It's completely computerized. So in the morning you, put, you fill the big tank with uh, uh, this kind of uh, stuff that you make out of sugar and water, and yeast. And at night you take away the... 10 gallon barrel of alcohol. Uh, this is AVL man, big ones. This is a, a sex machine, sex robots. And uh, so I wanted to make uh, the ultimate machine, of 
would give me the ultimate independence uh, to make a machine uh, for sex. And uh, in a way, it's a very s split, you could say, because on one hand, it makes me independent uh, from women in this case, but on the other hand, it made me completely dependent on mechanics and electricity. So this, this message was uh, actually the message of this piece. And we wanted to have this uh, work uh, functioning in all different kind of levels, of course, in the art world, which is the new field, because uh, uh, no, it, it's just the art world itself. But we also wanted to have it function in the, in the sex industry and in the medical industry. And we had some uh, very interesting contacts with this uh, association in the Netherlands that is, uh, is, is there to, well, uh, let's say, to, to give information about sexuality and solve sexual problems. And they were very enthusiastic about uh, having uh, machines for uh, satisfaction because they were not on the market. The only thing you have is the, the vibrators and things like that. But um, this was a big failure, and we never got them to work, unfortunately. It was too complicated for us. Uh, this is uh, some sculptures, an exhibition, and uh, this as well. Equipment. In this case, it's equipment to uh, butcher stuff. And um, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. there will be a slide uh, a little bit further. And it's a slide of the autocrat. And the autocrat is a, a kind of a mobile home that is built uh, for to for survival. So you can take this mobile home. You put it somewhere in the woods and then you can uh, catch the water from the rain. You can uh, fire the heating in the stove with wood. Uh, and then you can do some agriculture and hunting. And then I'm very much in. Uh, and then, of course, you have to, uh, if you're not a vegetarian at least, you have to butcher animals. And since I'm very much interested in, uh, like, not only the art object, actually everything around it, so the, the whole life around it, my own position around it, in it. And uh, so I said, okay, then I also should be, I should be able or must study how to butcher animals. And uh, um, so I, uh, I made a study to like the old fashioned ways of butchering uh, pigs in the Netherlands which is an extinct job, because uh, like here, everything is industrialized. So the, actually, the, um, and so everything is industrialized. So there are just a few farmers left that, you know, butcher their own pigs. And there's just a couple of butchers that come to do that. And I found those two very old little guys who taught me. And um, so for me, it was very important to do it, because in a way, it's a statement against industrialization of, uh, uh, food industry because I think it's the most, uh, uh, I think food is very important in life and I think like how the situation is now uh, becomes, people become very alienated from what they eat and especially when you're here in America, it's a, uh, I'd say it's very far away of where people should be. So anyway, so I studied this uh, old fashioned butcher stuff and I made this uh, equipment that you need for it. So it was not only the butchering actually, but also the preservation, uh, preservation of the meat. So you have to dry it or to salt it, to smoke it. So you can use it for a whole year. This is uh, some of the sausages, meatballs, and some stoves, and smoking oven. It's not a machine, it's a blacksmith's fire. And this is a, a sawmill to cut um, wood out of uh, trees. And it's built out of a motorcycle engine. And in the back there is a little uh, medicine factory and a butcher shop. There. And this is uh, uh, 
on the left is a generator. So actually the engine comes from this car on the right, which used to be my car. And um, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, it's Alfa Romeo with a, one of the fastest uh, turbo diesel engines uh, on the market. And uh, I decided to make a generator out of it. So I attached it to this uh, generator and in the middle we made this control unit. And the car itself, we changed in a chicken coop. And we did some studies uh, on the well-being of chicken. Like uh, what color do they like? How big should they, uh, the house be? And how many female and how many male and, uh, chicken you should have? And um, all these kind of things. And then we, well, we put everything together and made this uh, chicken coop. So in the back, the trunk, is the place where they make the eggs. And, uh, oh. and there is, um, so anyway, uh, I decided to, to take this car to completely recycle everything of this car into a uh, usable uh, object. Uh, bed. On the left is called the modular multi women bed. And um, uh, it also relates to this very old work with the tables very simple tables, which is also very modular and very minimal. But here then it's uh, changed into uh, a bed for like uh, a lot of people. So you can have, it's also a modular system, so you have uh, beds of uh, 120, 240, 250, 480, etc., etc., meters long, and different uh, three, three levels. Some furniture. I also did a lot of uh, collaborations with the architects and uh, the most famous of them is uh, Ram Kohlhaas that we did uh, you know, five or six projects with and this is a pro the first project we did with him it was a convention center in France where we built ten different bars and five hundred toilets. And this is another project, uh, uh, the Alliance Française, where we, uh, um, we did many different things. So we actually we made, uh, I call that, uh, uh, well, uh, an extension to the roof, so you could enter the, the attic, which is normally uh, not uh, accessible. So we created the one extra floor on top of this building, and uh, some things, and then on the first floor, we also make a, a completely mobile uh, space, that, which also, was also dividing um, this room into a library and um, executive office. And by moving this wall, you could create space to have a, a, for lectures, uh, or performances, and when you push back to the other side, you have a huge um, executive room for meetings and so on. Uh, these are some of the more simple works that I really cherish, that I really like. And it's uh, building kitchens and stuff for normal people, which are always, uh, they very have a very specific idea what they want, how many shelves, and where should be this and that. And uh, so for me, it's also very important to do this kind of simple work, not only working for star architects, or with star architects, but also make the the little things. And um, uh, the, not, the interesting thing, like for example, if you have something like the, the bars in France, like nobody is really attached to this thing. Like you know, people who work there don't, don't give a shit. The owner doesn't give a shit. And the architect doesn't give a shit. We don't give a shit. So because we build this thing, it's there, we make a photograph, and that's it. But these kind of things that are part of someone's houses are really uh, very close to someone's life. They are cooking there every day. They have an idea, they like it, they love it. So that's very important, I think. Uh, some facades. Uh, some toilets. A monastery in France. And this is uh, an extension to the museum in Rotterdam. 
and this museum they wanted to uh, say they um, they wanted to have a toilet space and they asked me and actually I don't like when museums are building stuff because I think a museum should exhibit stuff and what you see all the time is that museums they build so they ask very good architects to build mo the most fantastic the most expensive buildings you can imagine and very often those buildings are not very functional because for showing art you only need a place like this for example uh, very simple just white walls uh, some skylights and uh, a big door and a concrete floor that's all what you need actually basically you need a cheap industrial space and what happens very often is that museums start to build a new space and then they don't have any budgets to make exhibitions. So it's really silly and I saw it so many times. So I said always, I will never ever build a museum unless it's a kind of an industrial building, like the cheapest possible. Anyway, they asked me to make this extension, so then I said, okay, what, what shall I do? Well, let's make a dick and uh, make it in camouflage colors, like in a way you say, like, I don't want to be here. Yeah, so I make the, flag, the, the same colors as the buildings. The nice thing about this work is uh, how I dealt with this uh, regulation. Since it was a public building uh, in a museum and next to the restaurant, there were a lot of rules. Uh, because hygiene, fire people, uh, safety for the museum, like you can imagine how many rules there were. What I wanted is to make, I want to make a very beautiful uh, space inside, so everything was, uh, uh, nothing was straight, everything was like uh, sculptured, you could say. It's a very beautiful space, it's like the inside of the thing. And, uh, but the, the rule said that we need to have five doors, one in front of, uh, uh, one here, then you need to have two separate washrooms to wash your hands, then a door here, and a door here, and then here in the front. There should be a door as well. And that's, that meant that uh, all these beautiful things uh, would disappear. And then we devised uh, special hinges that, uh, and doors that open themselves. So whenever you leave the toilet, the door opens itself and disappears in the wall. And um, like that, we have the five doors which were uh, prescribed but they were never closed. And uh, so when the building inspector came, he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the doors were there, but uh, the doors were there, but they were always open. And in a way it was good, like this. This is a, a big uh, painted window, or uh, bars that we built in a, in a prison in Rotterdam. So I like uh, decoration a lot, actually, and of course I, I think a lot about uh, design and architecture. And the thing that I really miss in architecture is uh, decoration. I don't know why, I mean you see decoration, it is like very ugly decoration, but not like very flamboyant decoration. And I think actually the most disgusting thing uh, in architecture, I think, is the so-called high-tech buildings that uh, affect the construction uh, it's very complicated and, and actually serves as a decoration. And uh, so, th th what I miss in architecture is decoration. And uh, uh, so that's why we make this a beautiful window. These are the sensory deprivation chambers. Um, they are like small uh, rooms that you can go inside and sit down or lie down, and close the door, and like that you close off the, the lights, and the sound, and the air. And uh, the specific thing about this is that you make the space as small as possible. So you only they are as big as the space you need to go inside and to sit down or to do whatever it's necessary to do in the space. So for example, the space above your head when you sit in the chair, you actually don't need it, so you take it away. And uh, like that you get a very uh, uh, 
uh, non-designed design space. Of course, it looks very designed, but on the other hand, it's not designed. Of course, it's just a very simple, practical process of uh, cutting away uh, parts of the space. And there are two other ones. And that's, uh, the smallest is a helmet. And this is the biggest one we did. And, was, uh, and actually has all the functions of a house. So inside there is a toilet. So you can see like the space above the toilet that you drive the use out. And here there's a, a bathtub and shelving units. Here there's a kitchen. Oh, here's a kitchen. There is a office. And this is the bedroom. And this is the outer crack, the sculpture I talked about with the meat. Oh, this one. And here's the, the outside kitchen. And, uh, there's also a kitchen inside. Actually, the whole outer part is a big kitchen with a bed inside. And um, this um, this piece was actually inspired by uh, by the Shakers, this uh, religious group from America from about uh, 1830 or so, I think, uh, who lived in uh, some compounds uh, uh, around New York. And they decided to make uh, their own community. And um, well, what they did, they said uh, uh, to them, uh, working was like worshiping. So they wanted to make the best and the most beautiful uh, products. And because they wanted to do that, they had a lot of. Uh, uh, they uh, they made they made a lot of inventions. Uh, they invented, for example, a circular saw, a washing machine. They were also the first people who start um, to, um, how to say, to make um, genetical uh, improvements on seeds. And uh, but they also lived in their own self-supporting villages where men and women lived together, but they didn't have sex together. And. Uh, and they made just beautiful stuff, very simple. So for them was um, to make uh, the best thing with the smallest amount of time, with the smallest amount of uh, uh, material, with the smallest amount of uh, decoration. And um, then uh, we got a commission to do an urban planning Urban, to make an urban plan for the city of Almere. And actually, I don't like urban planning because I'm completely against urban planning because it, it, it decides many things, uh, gives a lot of limitations in a way. And you, you, you as Americans, they cannot really um, understand that unless you have been in Europe. But in, in Europe, there are really strict zoning walls. So you cannot build an office building in. Uh, a place where houses are. Uh, you cannot have a, a farm in the city. You cannot uh, uh, make a pink building between uh, red buildings. You can make not a building with a pitched roof next to a building with this. So there are many, many rules. And they are made by city towns. And uh, so anyway, so the city asked us to make an a urban plan for this village, for this town. And this town was a, a uh, built on man-made land. So it was a big lake, a big sea in the Netherlands that they closed off with a dike. They pumped out all the water and then they had this island which is about uh, 40 miles by uh, 15 miles across. And on this island are a couple of cities. And Almere is the biggest one and it has about 200 inhabitants, 200,000 inhabitants, which is uh, quite a lot for Dutch standards. And uh, so they asked a group of artists and architects and city planners to develop plans for their future because they needed to build 30,000 houses within three years' time. You know, where to build this house, what kind of houses, and so on. So we made a completely alternative plan for them. And we said, uh, okay, we want to make an independent state of this island. So why should you be, I mean, if you're an island, you're a man-made land, so the, the land is only 30 years old. 
Why should you be part of the Netherlands? Why should you be part of uh, Europe? So uh, let's cut the bridges and make our own economy. And we start with the building of 30,000 mobile homes. You can see on the left. And uh, everyone who buys this mobile home or builds this mobile home can put it anywhere he wants. So it can be in the city, it can be on the seaside, it can be in the forest, it can be in the park, it can be in the garden of your neighbor. So there were no, no rules at all. And then, uh, of course, some people, they stay with a little mobile home, some people start uh, to expand, like, for example, here on the right, which is actually Atelier de Nieshout, my company. We still have the autocrat, but they also have a big farm with dormitories and a big communal space, big kitchens. Uh, there is an arsenal to put, to put uh, weapons and so on. And This is a, a close-up of the building, and this is a, a kitchen scene. It's not completely sharp. Uh, it's a kitchen scene where uh, some uh, uh, women are preparing a very healthy meal, uh, organic uh, vegetables and so on. Uh, and, uh, but you also have a lot of weapons. A way uh, to show, like we are, we are, we are standing for our ideals and we are ready to die. They're all girlfriends. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we, again, some years later, you have uh, the same building, but then there was a blast furnace, there was greenhouses, there's a sawmill, and there are prison camps. And the prison camps, prison camps was actually, uh, so it was actually, we wanted to make this whole island uh, have an illegal economy based on illegal uh, uh, goods. Arms production, drugs, alcohol production, prostitution, whatever. And um, there's also, uh, if you read the newspaper in the Netherlands, they're always complaining like you don't have enough cells for the prisoners, so they have to send home prisoners Know, people who come to the airport of, of uh, Amsterdam with uh, 10 kilograms of uh, heroin and they say, okay, you can go. Well, you have to give the drugs, but we cannot put you in jail because it's, uh, we don't have any cells. And it was a big scandal actually in Holland. And the other thing they say about prisoners, it's too expensive because it costs about $30,000 a year to have one prisoner, you know, to have to house them, to uh, get them food, to guard them, and so on and so on. Well, when I hear something like, you know, $30,000 for one person a year, I say, well, I can do that much cheaper. So that's why we build those barracks for the prisoners. And at daytime, uh, they, uh, they work in the, in the drug factory or in the alcohol factory. And uh, at nighttime, they just spend it, you know, on, uh, on the island. It's a kind of a, a very uh, pragmatic plan, I would say. Like all the countries of Europe, they have uh, solved the problems. We have cheap labor and uh, uh, clients for our own products. Then uh, this is a, a drawing of um, the typical uh, alcohol production plant. So here there's a place where you mix the, the sugar with the yeast and the water. Then this is the still, and then on this side, uh, here this side, and on this side, there is the laboratory where you can mix the alcohol with herbs and uh, 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 spices to make uh, medicine. It's also a good thing, of course. The good thing, of course, is to make the medicine, and the bad thing is to make illegal alcohol and drugs. The blast furnace. An energy plan uh, to, uh, to provide like a little compound like that with energy. Uh, the idea was that you make alcohol out of uh, because you want to be independent of uh, all oil. So the only thing you can do then is to make alcohol out of uh, uh, wood or uh, uh, waste materials, like all kind of things you can make alcohol from. 
this alcohol is uh, uh, used to power this generator. Uh, well, this generator, of course, produces a lot of heat, which is normally, well, it's gone. But here, in this case, it's stored in these huge tanks. And those tanks are insulated. So the, the heat will stay inside for months or maybe years because it's a large, large mass and it's very well insulated. Then we also have renewable energy like wind power, solar power, solar panels, and all the waste heat is stored in these tanks. And the heat then is used for heating, for greenhouses, for warm water, and uh, and then actually the waste products of the alcohol uh, factory is very good pig food. So we just uh, add some. Uh, potatoes and carrots and nice things for the pigs and then um, they will uh, not only produce meat but also produce uh, uh, shit which can be processed in a biogas digester it's just kind of a system where you have all the, the feces come inside and then you heat it a little bit and you stir it a little bit and then you can get uh, a propane gas that you can use for, for cooking or you can burn in this uh, incinerator. So in a way, it was a kind of a, a closed circuit of energy. Like, uh, yes, closed circuit. Uh, weapons. Uh, so uh, this is uh, some drawings uh, that we uh, made for a machine gun. It's like a reinterpretation of an existing gun, but we simplified it and we changed it to European sizes. Um, which is a kind of machine gun that, like everyone who went to kind of a technical school, uh, uh, could make themselves. And that was like one of the products we set for this uh, free state of Almere. And this is the reality. Then uh, this. Um, so we presented this, uh, uh, this city plan, this urbanistic plan, to the mayor of this town. And he uh, said, uh, well, uh, thank you, but we're not going to do it. And of course, it was not intended as a serious plan. It was intended as a, as I say, uh, as a acquisition or a conceptual work about uh, urban planning. Because I think it's a complete waste when you have a city like Almere, this town which exists only for 30 years, they have a lot of space. There's only a few places in the Netherlands where they have a lot of space. And they also have a lot of possibilities. They could like really do interesting experiments. But what you see is that city, not all the cities in the Netherlands, but that city as well, maybe more than other cities, becomes very uh, 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 bourgeois, you could say. And uh, actually, Instead of that you have a lot of possibilities in this land, in that, count, in that island, you have almost no possibilities. Everything is designed, like every, everything in the public space, every ashtray, every tree, every bench, every, uh, uh, the color of the streets, everything is designed. There's not a single place that's not designed. And for me, uh, I think uh, that's not interesting. I think the place should grow, the city should grow and the country should grow. And a good example for that is that I, um, is those uh, favelas, the shanty towns in Brazil that I visited a couple of times. And um, those shanty towns are normally built on very steep hillsides or, and, or uh, uh, pieces of land next to the river or like pieces of land that cannot be used by, by regular uh, for regular buildings, and um, so, <clears throat> and there are also there are no rules there. Is, uh, there, is, there. So what happens that you know when you have a piece of land, you know it's a very steep little piece of land somewhere. You, you build your house, and you build the house from the material you find from the street or where you, what you buy somewhere, and the whole shape and the size of the building is completely. Uh, shaped 
by the material and the, the plot of land that you have. And very often when they find another piece of wood, well, they make it a little bit bigger. Or when they have another child, they make a little extension to the house. Or when they have uh, the, the, the children are big, they make another floor on top of the house. So you get a kind of organic architecture, which is very, very interesting to see. And it's very beautiful spaces, so especially the interior is like uh, very nice. And, uh, and what you see actually is that uh, after, let's say, five or ten years, the people who live in such a shanty town, they start, uh, they find some money and then they exchange the piece of plywood by uh, bricks. So they become like real houses, you could say, but they still maintain this very odd shaped, uh, organic uh, shapes, like almost like uh, houses like animal, animals would make them. And um, so for me, that's the, my preferred uh, way of city planning. Just, you know, let it grow, let it go. And um, so anyway, uh, this, the, the mayor of Almere, he was not very uh, fond of my plan. And uh, so I went to Rotterdam and, uh, oh, some weapons, sorry. Some of our weapons. It's a Saturday night special. So it's like specially made for you go to a discotheque. And that's uh, part of our team. And our team, I didn't tell about our team. Atelier van Lieshout, it's now about 35 people. And the most of them have a creative background. So they come from art or architecture or design, or they just, well, just come by. And um, uh, so we all, uh, the, the, the company, after you have these are structured as a company. So everyone actually is paid uh, and everyone has to come to work and so on. But on the other hand, we really prefer to that the people who design the work also build the work. Or at least are very much uh, uh, connected, I'd say, very uh, close to the production process. Uh, AVL Mortars and this uh, Mercedes uh, with, a, with a cannon. So everything you see, we built ourselves. And what we try to do is to find solutions to make this weapons with readily available materials and very simple tools. This is the alcohol production plant. This is a workshop for weapons and bonds. So here there is a little uh, workshop with a lathe and drill and all the kind of material that you need for weapons production. And in the back, there's a chemical laboratory with house, household and um, available industrial chemicals and manuals. And in the back, you can see here and here, it's the house of the terrorist. And he has a very round, nice round bedroom. And this is his office where you can make his uh, manuscripts, manifestos. And uh, what can I tell about this thing? I don't know. Many times I just don't know why I make those things. And um, I make all those dicks and weapons and functional objects and uh, machines and crazy urban planning. And actually, uh, for me, there's not like a really, like, how to say, a rational reason why I do this kind of things. But they just, they come. They come by themselves. and. Uh, uh, and when they come back many times, I think, as an artist, I think, well, probably it's necessary to make a container with this kind of a, a terrorist housing unit uh, attached to it. And that's uh, specific, I think, uh, for artists. And I think this intuitive uh, up, up approach is a very interesting one. And I think much more people should do that, actually. Because very often uh, what happens also in architecture and design that people make those things that the client wants them to make. And that's not very interesting, I think. I think it's much more interesting when things are made uh, because of passion or obsession, you 
let's say. And a good example, for example, is this, uh, this car, which is called the Citroën DS. This is like a car from the 50s, French car, very streamlined, very beautiful car. And this car was made by one man. So he did, you know, he had maybe some assistant, but he, he drew the car completely from every part. And you could say it's artwork, as it's, some, it's a person's uh, life in this car. And all the other cars that came after, and especially the cars now, it's a product that is not made by artists or designers, no, it's a product that is made by uh, marketing people and big groups of people that come together and make, make uh, a product. And, um, and I think that's not, that, I don't think that's a good development actually. And what you see is design nowadays is a kind of extension of marketing, of selling products, consumerism. And of course, there's nothing wrong with consumerism. I'm a big consumer myself. But on the other hand, when design is just like an instrument for that, then I don't think it's interesting. And um, so that's why I think, like you know, designers, art, architects, they should you know follow their intuition and do those things that that they think is necessary to do it and just do it. And then you see later what happens. And if you do it good, then probably uh, you have a chance that they uh, that you earn some money as well. Anyway, this is a hospital uh, for our own use. And this is Avialville. So we went to this, uh, the, the mayor of Rotterdam and we said, uh, 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 why did you give us a piece of land to build our free state? And say, yeah, it's good. And um, I, we actually we played a little game of course, but we say we want to restate them. We said, they say, we said we want to make something between uh, open air museum and a free state. We said, yeah, good idea. So they gave us a piece of land, and we, we said we want to have a carte blanche, which means uh, we want to have um, uh, a permit that we can do do our stuff as an as, as in free state. So we don't want to have uh, ask for building permits. Uh, we don't want to have any zoning rules. We just, you know, we are an independent state and we want to govern our own things. And they never said yes to that. They never said no, but never said yes. <laughs> that was a pity. Anyway, we made our free, spa free, uh, free state. We got a piece of, got two pieces of land. One is this piece of land, which is in front of our uh, studio. This is uh, our office. And we got another piece of land, which is um, a couple of hundred meters further away. And there we put our farm. And we had like all the, we tried to make everything that you need for a free state. So we had our own flag, we had the constitution, we had uh, money, and we had uh, schooling, healthcare, you know, all these things like that. <coughs> Uh, this is our workshop. So here this is the, the workshop where we actually produce all the mobile homes and furniture that we make. And here's a part of um, the infrastructure. And um, to, um, for me, uh, at the moment, I'm the, most inter no, uh, I'm the most interested in the infrastructure, making infrastructure. Uh, and actually making a mobile infrastructure. So not like an infrastructure like you have normally, that you have, you know, there's some, some things where you have to put your house now. I prefer to make uh, mobile energy plants, mobile uh, sewage treatment plants, and so on. So this is a compost toilet, which is a very low-tech way uh, of solving sewage problems. Instead of flushing the toilet, you uh, just throw some straw inside. And then after one year, it's composted in a kind of a well, uh, compost that um, is very um, well, friendly, very, I say, smells very nice. So it's completely changed in a, in a useful product. And this is a water tank to uh, collect rainwater, filter it. Uh, 
This was our outdoor kitchen. We also had a big restaurant here. Uh, that was uh, uh, intended for well, the people who work in AVL, but also for guests who came to, to visit us. And uh, we had like 15,000 visitors uh, last year, which is uh, uh, really a lot for, uh, well, for small organizations as ourselves. And um, the restaurant was uh, closed down uh, three months after we opened it by uh, police and fire people. So uh, we were not a free state. <laughs> we just had to do the same stuff as other people. So uh, we found many possibilities, uh, which was a kind of fun as well. Uh, so they closed down because they said, well, you cannot have a restaurant without a permit. And, uh, and then we said, no, we're not a restaurant, we are a foundation, we are like a sports club, you could say. Uh, no, 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 no. So we tried all those things, all those tricks, and then at a certain moment they said, um, well, we could sell food, but you could not sell alcohol. And they said, okay, it's not a problem. So we make like a little uh, grocery store, on the, on the, we had like one container left over. We make a little grocery store, so you had like one, one little bit of sugar, flour, some, I don't know, chocolate, and then huge quantities of uh, alcohol that people, so we just said to in the restaurant store, we cannot sell alcohol, but there is a grocery store, so you can get it there. Then this plan was, uh, uh, was, uh, I said, the pay out, uh, shut down, and then we make a souvenir shop. So you buy you know, a souvenir, which is a bottle of wine, and has like a, a label which says, regards from AVLville. <laughs> Didn't work out. Then, uh, what else did we do? Uh, uh, so there's a, of course it's in the harbor of Rotterdam. So there's another, you know, for ships is something different. A uh, ship is, uh, uh, already kind of free state. So the thing you could do is to have, you can sell, can sell alcohol on the water. So we just put like a little uh, rowing boat next to the land <laughs> with uh, full with beer and alcohol and then you know they could go you know to this ship and buy the stuff. No, it didn't work out. Well at the end what we did was that we uh, gave away the alcohol. I said okay we don't care you know when you eat you know just take it. <laughs> Drink it. And uh, that was the best solution. It was also very good because this was the best publicity you can get, you know. Wow, there's a restaurant where you can drink for free. And normally it's the other way around, you know, you buy the food and you pay like, you know, an uh, incredible amount for uh, some wine. Anyway, it was, uh, the restaurant was really picking up and then the, 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 the fire people came and then it was shut, closed down three times and they came with guns and armored stuff. And anyway, well. It was a pity because it was actually was also the, the way how to finance this whole thing because, uh, well, there's a lot of money to do stuff like this. And, um, well, actually, what was the free state? Uh, the free state was a piece of land next to our studio uh, intended for people who work or have been working or have, are important for the studio. So everyone who wanted could build their own house on this piece of land without building regulations, without technical regulations, without zoning regulations. And uh, so if they want, they could also get the material to build those houses for free from uh, my studio. And um, uh, uh, there's uh, actually only one house uh, built, except for the house that uh, belongs to here, ABL. This is a little bit how it looks like. And this is uh, a piece that's not really part of Abel Hill, but it, it's, all, it's located there. And it was a commission that we did for an uh, organization which is called Women on Raves, which is an organization uh, that uh, wants to uh, legalize abortion because uh, uh, um, 
They want to legalize abortion because uh, many women die every year because of uh, unsanitary uh, uh, operations and when they do it in an illegal way. So uh, research, is, research, research proof that well, even if you uh, don't, even when you don't allow abortion, doesn't mean that you have less abortions. When you have the same amount of abortions, the only thing that changes is that well, people have to do it uh, themselves and have to go to uh, some kind of a tech alley uh, practice. Anyway, I think 80,000 uh, women die every year because of it. So they asked us to build a mobile abortion clinic inside the shipping container. And uh, the idea was to put the container on top of a ship. They go to a country where it's not allowed, for example, Ireland. And uh, uh, then they go uh, on land and they make the give information, make the discovery about these kind of things. And then later, women can go aboard and go on international waters to have a safe abortion under Dutch law. And uh, uh, for, to me, it was a very interesting project because of uh, well, the idealistic goal they had. But also, we had to build a very small, complicated, high-tech uh, unit inside uh, a very small shipping container. And uh, so uh, the, the, the clinic made their first uh, trip uh, to Ireland. And we also make a little mistake because they forgot to ask for uh, approval from the Dutch state. And then uh, they were not allowed to do any abortions, but they did that trip and they gave a lot of uh, uh, information. I mean, it's not used, it's a uh, park in our land. This is some other stuff. This is the energy plant of Avialville, so this is the incinerator. This is one of the large uh, storage tanks, the indirect storage tanks that keep the heat uh, for a long period. So in winter time, you only have to heat this heater once a week, and then the rest of the week you can use it for the heat. And there's a generator over there. This is the energy plant. Oh no, sorry, this is the sewage treatment. So here's another compost toilet. And here's uh, all kind of organic, or uh, environmentally friendly way to recycle uh, wastewater. The farm, it's called Pioneer Set. All the structures, like all the stables and the houses and all the equipment and tools can be taken apart and transported in this container. So you can uh, take this container, ship it somewhere, and pack it both together, and then you have a whole functioning farm. Chicken, chicken house, stable, chicken, horses, this is the house of the farmer. So we actually had in, uh, in, in Avialville, uh, in Avialville we had this, uh, we built this farm and we hired a farmer for one year uh, to take care of the farm breed all those pigs and chicken, uh, grow vegetables. And this is the farmer. And this is one of the interns that uh, came to study at our, <laughs> at our uh, compound. So, well, the situation now is that uh, we closed down the free state uh, last month. Uh, and we closed it down because of the, it appeared to be uh, very difficult and very frustrating actually. Um, we had to give back the piece of land to the city because they had obligations with it. They had uh, plans for it, so they wanted to build some kind of a storage place. And uh, we ran out of money as well. And we got all this. Uh, people come to our studio, like uh, 50, I think, uh, government workers, you know, uh, who want to check everything. So we actually got much more, uh, much less freedom than was intended, actually, with our plan. So we, we get 
everyone there, like, you know, the firemen, the police, environmental police, uh, the river police, the water police, you got uh, Greenpeace, you got, uh, well, I don't know, everyone you can imagine came to visit us. And of course, we, I mean, we, get, we got a lot of publicity and then they said, no, it's not going to happen. So we closed down the place, which was in fact also good because it was a lot of work. And, um, but there are also many possibilities for the future. Of course, the city of Rotterdam also thinks it's a very interesting project and they really want to do something for it. And they have to find a way how to make an exception because they cannot just say to us, like, no, do it your way. And to all the other people, uh, you have to do it uh, their way. But the most, uh, so we have two offers actually. One is a piece of land of uh, 100 acres next to the airport, uh, which is uh, polluted and that we can use. And the other one, it's uh, probably the more interesting one. It's a huge uh, pontoon, so they have a pontoon at about uh, 300 foot by uh, 40 foot, and, uh, uh, 80 foot. Wow, you have a huge, the, huge uh, floating pontoon. And uh, they, they're thinking of uh, to give it to us, and, uh, which could be very interesting. It's not so big, it's much smaller than what we have, that we would like to have. But on the other hand, it's a floating structure, and that means uh, it has another, uh, has almost no rules. Especially when you uh, create your own energy, so you're not connected to the mainland, so you don't have electricity, water, or sewerage uh, connected to the mainland. Then you're considered as a ship, and uh, on the ship you can uh, do. Uh, so that's the the future of Avia, Avia Bill. And um, mm, I think there was the last slide. So maybe you have any questions? Are there any questions? Yes, I do understand your question. And um, no, for me, uh, uh, I'm, I, as, I told, as I explained in the work, I'm uh, pretty indifferent to many things. Uh, and to me, to, to work for uh, corporates, uh, uh, I call that, uh, corporations, or to work in, uh, in galleries or museums, uh, for me, is perfectly unitable uh, with my own goals. In fact, I can only do this build a free state because of those museums, because they, you know, they, in a way, they help me produce this kind of works. So, because when we exhibit them, they pay money to be part of the production. So, for me, uh, I'm not very interested in dogmas. So, uh, uh, I think, for example, uh, imagine we had the farm and we had to live from the farm, and there was not enough. Uh, food coming from, well, just go elsewhere and buy it. And uh, the same for many other things. And also the work that we do, we use a lot of wood and, uh, and 
fiberglass, which you can only buy uh, in the outside world, you can say. So for me, I don't have any uh, moral uh, 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 limitations. Uh, well, strangely enough, we didn't have any problems with the weapons. I mean, to, for the Dutch state, uh, uh, selling beer is more dangerous than uh, producing weapons. And, uh, and for me, a weapon is also, uh, I mean, it's a very common thing. I mean, if you switch on the television, every one minute you see, uh, you see a gun. And uh, so it's part of our life. And a gun, for example, is a, a much like, uh, for example, uh, a power drill. It's a much more complicated machine than a gun. A gun is like a really stupid thing. It's just like a tube with a uh, spring. And, um, but it's, it's more about the way how you use it, of course. And that's also the reason why I put those weapons there. And yes, I am not afraid of violence. And uh, I think violence uh, and aggression is part of our society. It's part of a human being. So you better can. To me, I just can recognize it and uh, and uh, make some money out of it. <laughs> then say no, a weapon is not good and it's bad. And uh, no, I, I'm very realistic in that sense. Yes. <laughs> no more questions. Then uh, thank you very much.